So I love Westerns. It's something about surviving in the wilderness, trying to get the bad guy, the quest for gold or glory. There's just one problem when I watch these films, though. It's that iconic wanted poster, wanted, dead, or alive. You've seen this poster, right? I mean, this is to signal to us, the viewer, who the good guy is and who the bad guy is, or who the bad guy is is doing good things. But the wanted poster, for some of us, because in all of these videos is a person of color, Mexican or Indian, usually not brought in alive. So my question is this. What does God want of us, want of us who show up on these posters? Now, I work in communities of color, specifically with students and scholars of color, people whose histories and lives have been stolen by the legacies of colonization and slavery. And my expertise in these communities is vocation or call or simply meaning and purpose. So I'll ask my question again. What does God want of us who are wanted dead or alive? Now, I think our text, our sacred texts, have some really good answers to this. I'm a father of two multicultural, multireligious children, so we often turn to sacred texts for answers, and we got plenty of stories to choose from. We could choose Moses surviving Pharaoh, Jesus surviving Herod as an infant, or Miriam surviving Egypt, Pharaoh, her brothers, God. But well, my favorite is Ishmael and Hagar in the book of Genesis. Now let's remember who Hagar is. Hagar is the handmaiden of Sarah, who's the wife of Abraham. And when Abraham and Sarah can't have a kid, Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham. Now she escapes this. She runs out into the wilderness, and we first see God meet Hagar in chapter 16 of Genesis and says she escaped because they dealt harshly with her. This is the same phrase is used for how the Egyptians treated the Israelites. So she is running for her life. And as she's out there in the wilderness, God says to Hagar, I have heard your cries of distress. And then after telling her she should go back, which I don't understand, but tells you should go back, promises her a son, Ishmael, which means God hears and promises a great nation will be made of that boy. Now you would think a story like this, okay, Good things happen. I mean, it's not Disney, though. It's, the, it's Scripture. So she goes back, and by Genesis chapter 21, they're back at this oppression thing. Sarah has her own child now and tells Abraham, cast them out. So Abraham, the father of Ishmael, only gives them bread and water and sends them on their way. Bread and water. Can you imagine that? Your dad giving you bread and water and send you on your way? So they're out in the wilderness. The bread runs out. The water runs out. And Hagar pushes Ishmael underneath a bush and turns her eyes to God and says, do not let me watch my boy die. I'm a parent. I, I can't imagine praying that prayer. Let me pause this story here. When I read this story, I know that boy. I know Ishmael. See, growing up in Salinas, California, it's a small agricultural community known for three things. John Steinbeck, lettuce, and poverty in the lettuce fields because people who pick that lettuce can't afford to put it on their table, and gang warfare. It's got one of the highest rates of gang violence per capita in the entire country. One of my favorite authors, Octavia Butler, in her parable trilogies, makes a brief stop in Salinas. Her character surviving post-apocalyptic California find three things in Salinas. They find books, John Steinbeck. They find water, and they find a gun. Now, she may have been writing fiction, but she was writing my life. Because at the age of 12, when my parents split up, my dad, Latino man, just, you know, the perfect dad, got cast out of our house. And my mom invited a stranger to come and move in. Now, this stranger had all the markings of his own trauma, and the way that he dealt with it was abuse and addiction. 
And so being a young person, only 12, sitting there at my white laminate desk doing my homework one day, I realized it was going to be one of those afternoons. I could hear the stranger downstairs stomping around looking for someone or something to dominate. So for those of us who show up on wanted posters, this was my chance to be a good guy or a bad guy who does bad th- good things. So I started slinging insults his way to protect my younger brothers. He comes upstairs, says, I'm going to get you, you brown pow. We start to fight. This six foot two man trained by our military, inflicting his will on a five foot nothing little Latino boy. I knew Ishmael. Our fight ended with him, his hands around my neck, lifting me up off the ground. God, I remember calling out for my dad, who I imagine was like Hagar, was cast out into the wilderness, not knowing what to do in this moment. So here, right here, this is the moment that it matters to do vocational discernment. When life is on the line, this is when it matters. Who is calling you to life? That is my question. I knew Ishmael. This was my home. This was supposed to be my inheritance. I was supposed to be safe here. I was God's beloved. That's what I had been told. Lucky for me, the text moves on, and so is my story. I'm obviously standing here. So we have Hagar who's placed Ishmael under a bush to die, turning her eyes to God, saying, do not let me watch my son die. And God responds. God has heard the cries of the boy where he is. Go and lift up the boy with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And so God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And so she went and filled up her skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Now, something I didn't mention, that first time God and Hagar met, Hagar named God El Roy, which means God of seeing or God of my seeing or God who sees. So you have Hagar, who's one of the only people to name God in the Bible. It's the first woman to be named, given a dynasty. Out here, calling out on a God who sees and a God who hears. Ishmael's God hears. That God has heard the cries of the boy where he is. I think we got something special here. God hears and sees the cries of the afflicted where they are and calls on us who are with them to come and lift them up with our hand. Now, my story didn't end that night either. I remember waking up the next day, sore from the night before, gathering my books, trying to shove them into my backpack, rushed downstairs, made sure my brothers were okay, get in the car to go to school. And we're on the drive to school, and I remember something. I didn't do my homework. It's amazing what the mind can do in these moments of trauma, that we can think and focus on things that really don't matter that much like homework. And so as we pull up to the school, the principal who stood outside our school every single day was standing there, and I wanted to do everything I could to get by him as quickly as possible so I could find a small corner of the campus to get my homework done. And as I went by him, still sore, head down, I'm trying to go as fast as I can, I hear those words, good morning, Patrick. And I look up at the principal, and my eyes fill with water, and I cannot stop crying. And the only words I can get out are, I didn't finish my homework. You see, I went to a special school, Christian Brothers School in Salinas, California. My my dad had the wherewithal to call me to life, saying that education and faith can save your life. He placed me in the school because he had promised me something great. So I didn't want to miss out on this opportunity. He's the only, one of the only Latinos at this school. As one of the only kids from my side of town, I had this neighborhood on my back as well. I didn't want to lose out on this opportunity. And the principal, seeing this broken young man before him, 
listen to me and just ask me for one thing. Can you get me a piece of paper and a pen? So I get my backpack, hand him a piece of pen, thinking, okay, this is done. I'm, I'm gone. And he writes me a note, get me out of homework for that day. And after seeing me and listening to my story, he says, you know, Patrick, we want you here. Take advantage of everything we have here. Do sports, any advanced classes you want to take, extracurriculars. I was in the band yearbook. Anything I could do to stay on campus, you can do. I was wanted. So for every day for six years, I got dropped off at about 7 a.m. and left at about 8 p.m. So you can see the thread here, right? That God calls us to life. God hears and God sees and calls us to life. My invitation to you is that this isn't just my story. There is so much happening in the world right now. And whether it's poverty, abuse, addiction, racism, homophobia, we live in a really tricky time in politics. It's a nice way to say, hopefully this is time stamped for a lot of years beyond this. This is a tricky time right now, politically. <laughs> for people like me who are in education or food deserts, this call to life extends to all of us. So I want to leave you with a few things. If you're like Ishmael, hear me when I see you and I say to you, I see you, I hear you. Hold on one more day. One more moment. You can make it. God has promised greatness for you. And if you're like the Hagars in the room, we need you to see us, to hear us, and to lift up our head and carry us in so that we can do the work that God has promised us to do. The writer and theologian Howard Thurman is attributed for saying, do not ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come fully alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who come alive. So as you discern the many thresholds in your life, as you navigate jobs, moving, as you think about love, because that's something we discern a lot about, and relationships, as you navigate family and toxic relationships, because that's also something we navigate, ask these two questions. How am I called to life? And how am I calling others to life? Because after all, you are wanted, fully alive. Thank you.